Ambassador Todd Chapman, thank you for being with us. Oh, Chui, it's a great pleasure. I look forward to our conversation. I have so much enjoyed reading about you. You have had such a long and storied career in the Foreign Service. What inspired you to join the Global Tech Security Commission? Well, it was a real pleasure to, to have that long career, and I thank you for recognizing it. But I'll tell you, one thing that inspired me about joining the commission is it's an opportunity to continue serving on issues that are of global importance. And one of the things that you do see when you are an ambassador or career uh, government servant is you see that you have lots of opportunities, lots of abilities to influence, but there are certain limitations to that. And so now the commission, by bringing together experts from government, private sector, industry, uh, it, it's just going to be a wonderful opportunity to pool together tremendous resources to advance a theme that we're all passionate about. And that is the theme of technology must advance freedom. And I Absolutely. know that, yeah, and I know that we talk about, you know, a lot about trusted technology, right? Technology that is based on, you know, um, human rights, value, security, freedom, all of that. And I was wondering throughout your diplomatic career, how has the adoption of trusted technology changed the international landscape? Yeah, well, Twee, if you think about the history of international relations over time and how technology has greatly impacted that, going back to the telegraph and then the telephone and, and then the advent of internet, I remind our younger listeners that I joined the Foreign Service in 1990 pre-internet. And so technology has been disrupting international relations for a long, long time. And so for many countries in the world, getting any technology is better than not having technology. But as we are progressing, it's becoming increasingly clear that technology can be used for good or it can also be used to oppress. And so this is really one of the reasons that inspires the commission to exist is that we believe it's important. It's not only important, it's vital that technology advances freedom and not oppression. And so I believe the commission is challenged with the important task of coming up with practical, pragmatic steps that countries, companies, and private individuals can take to ensure that that actually does happen. Well, let's do a, a deeper dive on that. Um, can you recount a specific instance where you witnessed the detrimental impact of authoritarian use of technology by, let's say, the Chinese Communist Party during your time as ambassador to Brazil and Ecuador? And how did that affect diplomatic relations? Well, Tui, I think it's important to underscore that for the developing world, and I know we don't use those terms as often anymore, but for countries that are not as blessed financially, their first objective is to get technology any way they can get it, because it's important for their country's development. And I think this is one of the challenges that those of us on the commission have to face, is that countries want this technology, uh, even if it's coming from groups that don't share our values. And so it's incumbent on us, those that do share the values of freedom, of uh, protecting human rights and democracy, et cetera, that we find ways to make this technology available. Because if we don't, then these otherwise erstwhile partners will be looking elsewhere. And so I can just give you examples from my own experience in Ecuador and Brazil where government officials were faced with very difficult decisions about the kinds of technology that they would allow to come into their country. Sometimes they did make exceptions to allow untrusted technology into their countries, and it resulted in negative consequences for them. Can you give an example of that? What a particular yeah. technology and what was the consequence? Yeah, the, you know, and I'm not gonna be overly specific, but I can say in one country, they allowed um, the Chinese to come in and put in surveillance technology that is uh, all pervasive. And that then allows a foreign government to have access to their private citizens wherever they go. They put in cameras into taxis in order to protect the passengers, which sounds like a very you know, nice thing to do for public safety. But at the same time, do you wanna let a foreign government know where every person is going within your country that could be geolocated and using facial technology, you know that 
I went to such and such store or whatever. These are things that in the United States or elsewhere in you know, democratic countries would be seen with great suspicion. But in order to get a certain kind of ability or capability, countries were forced to make these kinds of exceptions. And so I think it's figuring out ways to help countries not to have to compromise on principle in order to get the technology which they desire. And that is such an interesting conversation right now too, especially around AI, I know. Yes. Um, by contrast, can you share a specific example of how technology has been utilized to promote freedom and counter authoritarianism in a particular country or region that you dealt with? Yeah, well, I'll, I'll go back, uh, way back to 1993, Twee, when I first moved to Mozambique, which at the time was the poorest country in the world. But they were deciding at that time to skip landline technology and to use cell phones. And the, the amount of benefit that that brought to a country that had been devastated by civil war can hardly be overemphasized. So that goes back 20 years. More to the present, you look at countries trying to set up networks for their own government security. And in Brazil, in the previous regime, while I was US ambassador, the government made the very specific decision not to allow Huawei into their government networks because of the law that requires all Chinese companies. This is a, a law of communist China. This isn't something we're, we made up. Uh, that requires all Chinese companies to provide all the information that passes through their systems. Well, the Brazilian government then took that very seriously and made public that indeed this was not going to be allowed in their government network. Mm. That was a bold decision. Now for the private sector, the challenge was, do you want to be developing, you know, through R&D information that is worth a lot of money and then passing it through Chinese networks. Well, we know the history of communist China in terms of, of theft when it comes to intellectual property rights. We see it here in America. So these are the difficult decisions which countries have to make. And these are the things which have a detrimental effect on countries in their economic development is if they're giving the communist Chinese access to their intellectual property, just as one example. You know, you kind of have been touching on this throughout your answers, but I would love to hear you expand on it some more, which is how has the role of technology in diplomacy evolved during your career? And how do you expect it to continue evolving well into the future? Well, I think, Tui, one of the, the characteristics of being a diplomat is you are asked to represent the interests of your country on a wide range of topics, topics on which you may or may not be an expert. And I can assure you there are very few U.S. diplomats who are experts in technology because mm -hmm. the field is growing so rapidly. So it's very important to figure out for uh, the diplomatic core of Western or democratic principled countries, how do you prepare yourself as a diplomatic service to represent uh, your national interests on issues that you are not an expert on? So this is one of the great things that the commission is going to be addressing is how do you help think about AI and what are the issues from a diplomatic perspective that one needs to be advocating for? And so it, it's becoming increasingly important that there are tools that are made available for you know, principle-based, democratically-based countries and their diplomatic services to know how to advocate uh, for principled, trusted technology. Because as you have said, it is vital that technology advances freedom. And how can you put that in the hands of authoritarian governments who are established and dedicated to the exact opposite? And so this is what I believe the commission has an opportunity to make a substantive contribution. You know, the points you're making are so important and, and it's a obviously a very critical discussion now in Washington, right? A bipartisan discussion around the sphere of influence from China. And so I wanted to ask you, how is the Chinese Communist Party using technology to expand its sphere of influence, particularly in places that you have served 
in Latin America, and, and also are the BRICS countries, that is those countries in the fast growing economies of Brazil, Russia, India, China, South Africa, are those countries at risk from technology that is not trusted? Well, I believe that all countries are at risk that use untrusted technology because it's handing the keys to your information to an authoritarian regime, which is not accountable to its own people. You see, sometimes, Twe, I'm asked, well, you know, the United States government has ways to penetrate communications networks and look at things, whether for intelligence or anti-terrorism purposes. I say, yes, that is correct. But we are a government that's ruled by laws, that can be challenged by courts, and there are consequences if you go beyond the law. All of those things do not hold true when you're dealing with authoritarian regimes. Good luck taking a lawsuit against Huawei to Shanghai. Good luck with that, because it's not going to happen. And so it does have tremendous consequence. But the important thing is that we have to do as democratic and principled uh, countries is to lead the effort to demonstrate that this technology can lead to very unfortunate consequences for your country. And in direct response to your question about how the, the communist Chinese are using untrusted technology, it's not just for intelligence purposes, but it's also they use it as a, as a wedge commercially to say, if you do not take this untrusted technology, we may not let you sell your products to our country. You see, they have weaponized the trade issue in a way to advance their national interests in ways that are concerning. Now, we as the United States, we can stand up firm and strong to those kinds of threats. If you're the country of Malawi or Bulgaria or Ecuador or you know some other smaller nation, it's very difficult to stand up to that kind of commercial bullying. And this is what the EU, the United States, Canada, Japan, we need to help come up with diplomatic ways in which to help countries that are being bullied commercially. I think that is one of the next steps that we have to address in terms of diplomatic relations. And it's the next step in our commercial diplomacy is how to help our smaller democratic countries that are feeling pressured by this commercial bully. And what you're saying is so um, crucial because it points to the importance of collaboration. And yes. is there? A, and I wanted to ask you about your going back again to your extensive diplomatic career. Mm -hmm. Is there a particular instance from your diplomatic career where you witnessed the power of collaboration of nations coming together and multi-sector leaders in tackling emerging challenges related to um, global tech security? And what strategies or approaches did you find were most effective in building coalitions? Yeah, I think it's it's very important to find like-minded countries. And like-minded is a, a phrase we use in diplomacy when we're trying to come up with coalitions that are not necessarily that formal, like-minded countries in support of some kind of effort. And I believe it's gonna be vital to do that because when you come together as a coalition, not only are you stronger, not only are you more able to influence, but you provide cover for the members of the coalition. And I believe this is what we have to figure out a way to do when it comes to trusted technology, is we need to find a way to come up with like-minded countries, like-minded companies, and like-minded organizations to come together to provide a set of principles, guidelines that will help the adoption of trusted technology. And one of the big challenges, Twi, is quite frankly, with the private sector itself, and I'll say the US private sector, the European private sector, because of the types of commercial bullying which the communist Chinese employ, they, the, these companies have to always be looking over their shoulder because China is a big market for their companies. And so they do not want to be individually targeted. A way to address that is coming up with like-minded coalitions. We have seen this done. We have seen this through the Kimberley process when it comes to blood diamonds in Africa. We have seen this on issues related to anti-apartheid uh, protests that I got to witness, you know, through the, you know, years leading up to the Mandela government in Southern Africa, in South Africa. 
There are plenty of examples of like-minded people coming together. And I believe we now need to use the commission and other people that are interested in trusted technology to promote freedom, to come together in a like-minded coalition. And that's a nice way to wrap up this interview, I think, which is you're pointing to the role of the Global Tech Security Commission. Why do you think it's so important in securing our freedom? It's because my hope for the Global Tech uh, Security Commission, of which I'm proudly a commissioner, is that we will come up with pragmatic alternatives and pragmatic action steps that we can help companies and countries take to ensure that technology advances freedom. I don't want to be here 10 years from now or 20 years from now and see that authoritarian regimes have used it to further oppress their people, which is happening to me right now. This is not theoretical. This is real. And so it's incumbent on us as companies, as investors, as voters, and as, as uh, governments that we come together on this very important issue. Ambassador Todd Chapman, it has been such an honor to speak with you. Thank you for joining us. Thank you, Tweet.